Welcome to Leaders Upgraded, the place where people who want to upgrade and fast track their career, their life and their leadership journey tend to gather. I am your host, Tanvi Gautam, and I shall be speaking to the top 10% of the world's leading authors, CEOs and thinkers to bring you some of the best and brilliant ideas to fast track your way to success. Would you like an upgrade? Let's do this. Today, I'm talking to Charlene Lee, New York Times bestselling author of Open Leadership and The Engaged Leader. The world we live in today is so heavily influenced by social media. Reputations and brands are being built on social media. And yet, there is a huge opportunity for us to have a discussion on what does it really mean to show up as a leader on social media. When I work with executive coaching clients, whether it is on personal branding or I work on culture transformation, where we need to start telling the story of the organization to a larger audience on social media, or it is simply putting out the right messaging about the company so we can attract the right talent. Social media has become front and center to the relationship, the organization and its leaders have with employees within as well as outside the organization, the relationship they have with their current as well as future clients. But this conversation is not an easy one because there are some myths associated with it. There are also some fears associated with it. And there is a need for a particular mindset to come along when we start thinking about what does it mean to be a truly open leader on social media. And these are just some of the themes that we shall be tackling in the conversation today with our guest. So let's get started. She is regarded as the top marketing influencers by LinkedIn. Fast Company thinks she's one of the 100 most creative people in business. And she is regarded as one of the most influential women in tech. So welcome, Charlene, to the show. Thank you for having me. One thing that I have always wondered, and I think you're just the right person to ask this question to, there are firms like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, which are born in the in the, in the digital environment. But for a lot of other organizations to use a software term may be very legacy in some senses of the word. It can be a, a process where people have to be brought in kicking and screaming. I and mean, the one, the number one that I hear from people is, well, I'm too afraid to go out there and say something because what if I say something wrong? And then what happens? What happens then, Charlene? What do you say to that? Well, what I say to them is they think about the worst case scenarios rather than the best case scenarios. Hmm. And it's so easy to do that when the risk seems so high. But I say to them, you know, you say things to customers all the time and they repeat them. You say things to the press. You, you, you know what you can and can't say as a leader. So have confidence in that you know how to be a leader. That's the fundamental thing. I, I keep reassuring them. I, it's much easier to teach a leader how to use these tools than to teach somebody who, know how to, who knows how to use these tools how to be a leader. Mm-hmm. And, and they exercise good judgment day in, day out. So trust in that judgment. Now, when you, when, so when I ask them to go out there and start doing this, the first thing I ask them to do is to listen, not to even say anything. Mm-hmm. Listening, there's no risk to listening. Mm. And then once you know what the conversation looks like, then you can start to say things. And the things that you would say are very much driven by the things that you want to get done as a leader for your organization. What are your goals and your objectives? And if you center on that, then that gives you a lot more structure for what you will say and how you will engage. Mm-hmm. You know how to act. You know what you have to do to get done, get things done as a leader. So trust in that. Know what you do offline works, and you can do many of the same things online. Mm-hmm. I, a lot of the work that I do with executives and executive teams is to help them gain that confidence. Mm-hmm. And I ask them, if you could tell somebody a group of people or customers, something right now, a story that you would say to them, what would you say if they were standing right next to you? And I don't know a single leader who couldn't tell me a story that would inspire those people to the action that they would like to have them do. Mm. So that's what you share. Focus on that. And and if you are confident about what that message is and that relationship, then you'll know what to say. 
Yeah, that's it. I, I love that example of, of the story that you would tell if you could tell that story. I think if you can't tell that story, I think we have a bigger problem than on our hands than just social, I would think. Exactly, exactly. And what I find so true is that people who are comfortable using these tools are extending the type of leader they already are offline into the digital space. So if you're a leader who engages with people, wants to hear from people what they're saying, talks, wants to have that two-way dialogue in real life, really values powered employees, you're going to feel very comfortable in this space. If you're comfortable with customer feedback, if you're not, and, and I hear this from people all the time, well, what if that people give me negative comments? It's going to make me look bad as a leader, right? Mm. I never hear that from confident leaders who are very comfortable with who they are as a leader and their fallibilities and their vulnerabilities in real life do fantastic in the digital space. Mm. You and I, we spend so much time on, on social media and, and, and we know that there is an entire category of people who will, you know, criticize and come after you no matter what. As I mean, if you have an opinion, you have to be prepared to deal with, you know, people who think you are the best thing since sliced bread. And then there are people who think, you know, your Twitter account should be shut down. So, so you know, I think it's just the, the nature of the medium is that a lot of things are getting amplified and one just has to, you know, learn to take it in, in one stride. And I think that idea of the identity as a leader and, and being grounded in that is so much more important before we can get into some of this. And I know that I think in open, you have talked about this idea of failure, actually, right? Dealing with failure. And, and it happens to the best of us with the best of intentions. So reading somewhere where I said that the issue is not that you fall down. The issue is how quickly do you get up after you fall down? So I was hoping you could you could talk a little bit about your view of when, despite the best of, you know, intentions, things do start to go wrong or, or you know, things do fail. What is your suggestion there? I, I think this is a big, a, a very important trait of leaders and of organizations is how resilient are you mm. in the face of failure? Because if everything goes right all the time, then you're probably not taking enough risk. <laughs> yes. You're not moving fast enough. And, and so if, if your main job is to avoid risk and avoid making mistakes, then you're probably not growing as an organization and as a leader. Mm-hmm. And the, the, there's a delicate balance between how fast do you push forward so, to the point of breaking, and then also what's that, how do you build in that recovery, that resilience? Look at the whole process of agile development, being in the, in the tech space. Agile is all around making lots of decisions very quickly so you can decide what's working and what's not. So you can have that level of discovery constantly. Mm-hmm. But it requires that every, every, with every decision, you have the chance of failure. And failure is a good thing in the agile development space because then you know not to keep going in that direction before investing too much in it. And I think failure as a leader is something we put upon ourselves like failure is bad versus failure is something that's an imperative. And it's one of my favorite chapter in open leadership. It is the sense that you have to feel comfortable with failure and comfortable explaining it and being able to recover it and confidence in the relationship with your followers. That when you fail, everyone goes, yeah, we won't do that anymore. Let's keep going. Mm. So I'm listening to a podcast by James Altucher and he he mentioned this there, and I absolutely love it. It was just a few days ago, which was that the opposite of success is not failure, but rather a story, and it's a story that you can learn from. And if you start seeing it like that, it it does become a lot easier. Although I have to say, Charlene, as I listen to you talk about you know your approach as a leader to vulnerability and fear and the rest of it. It requires a certain level of evolution in your own thinking and approach towards what it means to be a leader. And at the same time, I kind of look at the kind of the pressure that leaders are put under nowadays, whether it's in terms of delivering results or being able to meet the the targets that are in front of them. And it, it just sounds like 
So while we are asking our leaders to step up and adopt this new paradigm of leadership, so to speak, there is likely a need for some evolution of ecosystem as well in what we are expecting out of our leaders. What do you think? Well, I think there's a synergy between organizations and leaders, and there's a fit between the type of leader and the type of organization that they're leading. Mm -hmm. So to your point, there is there's this need to have things operate in a different way. There's a whole movement, holacracy, and mm -hmm. organizations like Responsive.org that are asking, that are taking that whole agile development space and taking it across your whole entire organization to an extreme where there are no leaders. It's completely self-organizing, mm -hmm. and you're very clear about what your goals and purpose and mission are, mm -hmm. and you evolve the teams and, and leadership um, based on that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a completely radical departure from traditional notions of hierarchical traditional leadership. Mm -hmm. I see, what I see happening in organizations today is something at an informal level of that happening. Mm -hmm. leaders are evolving all the time, not because of their titles, but because of the connections and relationships they can cross organizations and across departments and even across industries and ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So when we talk, I love the way that Twitter talks about it. You know, how many followers do you have? And by that <laughs> implication, it's, mm -hmm. it means that you're a leader. People are following you because of what you're saying. And what if we were to define leadership as not by the checks and the P and L's and things that you get done necessarily, mm -hmm. but by the quality of the relationships in the leaders and the followers. Mm -hmm. but there was this concept back from the 1980s that came out around followership. Mm -hmm. And I, I raised that idea again in, in the Engage Leader book that leadership really is the art of followership where you're building and thinking about actively the type of relationship you want with your followers. And that's where the organizational aspect comes in. It, are, are there followers willing to follow you? Mm -hmm. Are they inspired by you as a leader in the way that you inspire them? Mm -hmm. And it's really unique. I, I could not function in certain types of organizations. They just wouldn't know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, the right follower has to come into my organization and be willing to be led in the way that I aspire to be leading them. Mm -hmm. That's that's a dynamic that we don't often touch upon. Another pushback that comes from leaders is, well, the people who I'm hoping to influence, I may be a partner in a consulting firm, and, and why should I be spending some time on Twitter or LinkedIn or any of it? Because you know, I I am in a you know B two B model. I talk to other CEOs, and guess how many CEOs are on Twitter or LinkedIn? And so. The people who I'm really hoping to influence are not there. So I, I, my, my clients and, and, and customers are not really there. So, you know, I have enough on my plate anyway. So why should I be spending time there? <laughs> sure. That's a great question. B2B is one of the most fascinating areas and, and the places where I think this has the biggest impact, not B2C. Mm. Primarily because B2B, the, the decision-making process is so long and so many people are involved. Believe me, the person who you may be meeting with at the top of the organization who signs a contract ultimately is not the person who makes a decision. Mm. I mean, they, they really are influenced along the way by a multitude of people. And those people are using Twitter. And in fact, the numbers are something like something like 47 percent, I believe, of decision has been made before they even contact you. And it's primarily because of the, the digital content that's out there. So the fact that you made the shortlist was primarily through no doing of your own. Mm. That that relationship, I think, is really important to understand um, through an entire decision-making process over time, be able to sustain that relationship um, through these channels. And I would challenge any professional who says, well, my contact isn't on any of these channels. I go, how do you know that? Hmm. If you've never checked. Hmm. So I, I go, if one of your key customers was using this, if one of your key clients was using these tools to so talk about what they're doing, what they're, what's important to them, wouldn't you want to listen to what they're saying? Hmm. Hmm. So the expectation is that you are. Right. And I also, you know, my, my response is also very often that, you know, 
whereas maybe, maybe they are not there right now, but that doesn't mean that they, right at this moment as we are talking, are not thinking about being there. And how much more would they admire you for having taken the lead and been there already? So, you know, talk about leadership by example, so to speak. So, you know, that's that's an interesting question. Plus, not to talk about, you know, this business of, you know, the leader being a, a prototype of what the organization stands for. And so, you know, the next generation of talent that's coming in. I mean, I find it very eerie when I have to go meet a client or someone, uh, you know, could be someone senior, for example. And I just can't find them anywhere. I can't find them on LinkedIn. I can't find them on Twitter. I have no sense of this person. I, I feel so strange that in, you know, in, in today's environment, that when you kind of look through the digital keyhole, you don't find them there. Right. So a lot of it is also about the relationship building that, that happens by being on that platform, whether you, you know, your so-called target customer or client is there or not. I, I absolutely agree. And and the fact of the matter is, is that if a client is looking at you and looking at your comp- competition and they have a digital footprint and you don't, guess who they call? Yes, absolutely. And I've seen that happen a lot, even in it comes to, you know, social recruitment, where between two candidates, you have to choose one and they end up going with the one who actually has a digital presence. So in your book, you you make this very interesting distinction between the challenges of onboarding people who are sitting in the C-suite or the partner level who are looking at this and going, but why do I have to do this? Versus mid-level managers whose resistance to being more social or being digital can come from a very, very different... So uh, I was hoping you could talk about that distinction a little bit. Yes. When you're at the top of the, you have a very different perspective. First of all, if you're lucky enough to be in in an organization where the leadership is digitally engaged, move the entire organization forward so much faster. Mm. And and part of the problem sometimes is that they don't see that as part of their job. The other problem though, the much, much more common problem is that they kind of get it. They kind of support it. They're waving the flag and cheering everybody on from the digital sidelines, but they themselves are not engaged. Mm. And it, this is that dissonance that we talked about earlier in the show. And again, the, the key thing here is that they take those first initial steps mm. based on those leadership goals that they know so well and so, so passionate about. But then the middle layer, that sort of a middle manager layer, you can face a lot of resistance from them too as well. Because as these power relationships, power distances are closing between the top executives and the front lines, the middle people are like, wait a minute, I used to be the gatekeeper. I used to <laughs> convey the information from the bottom up and then explain the decisions from the top down. And now they're going around me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're watching all this information go back and forth and people are excited because they're talking to the CEO. And you're like, wait a minute, what's my job now? So I think it's really important to define for them that their job isn't no longer being a gatekeeper, but being facilitators. They have a different mindset and skill set. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you know, the the I was fascinated by the parallels that you drew in the book about the five stages of grief and the five stages of onboarding leaders onto the platforms. It was very interesting, the whole anger to the bargaining, to acceptance and transforming the self and transforming the organizations. I'm not going to give a lot of it away because I want people to pick up that book and read it. But it was it was very fascinating because I have seen the entire spectrum of reactions from denial to, you know, fi- finally transforming the organization. Is there a way to short circuit that, that path? That's the way to tie it to a really important goal for that leader. Mm. There's nothing, I don't call it a burning platform mm. uh, because it sounds so negative to force them off. But, but, but in many ways, that's what you need. Mm. They go, I really need to accomplish this. And if, I, if this is one of the best ways for me to get there, then I'll, I'll get through this pretty darn quickly. Mm. And, and I'll do whatever is needed to accomplish what we need to get done here. Mm. I think, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's one of the most important takeaways from the book is that we kind of, uh, kind of start this conversation from the wrong end of the stick, where we talk, we're talking about you know platforms and tools and technologies, etc. 
Whereas, you know, you very uh, rightly draw attention to, okay, let's talk about what your goal is. And once we have talked about what your goal is, the rest of it will, you know, kind of take care of itself. So I think that was really, really good advice. Now, in your book, you, you've talked about three key things that the engaged leader should pay attention to. One is about, you know, listening at scale, just being able to tune into these conversations as you were talking about earlier. The second is called share to shape, which is focused a lot on what to share and how to share of stories, the role of emotions and that I really liked in there was, you know, how do you want your your followers and your clients and your employees to feel? And I thought that was such a powerful question. Really, really love that one. And the third was engage to transform, which focuses on, you know, engaging with a purpose. And how could you do that? And the different ways you could you could get into it. And, you know, I let let the listeners get into the three themselves. But the what what I was really curious was about in the from listen at scale and you know share to shape and engage to transform and there are overlaps between all three it's not exactly a linear process in your experience where do leaders get stuck most which is the most difficult part to for them to grasp uh, and run with i i think it's that to be honest, I think it's frankly just beginning with listening. Mm. The fact that you can listen to many, many, many people and that you should listen to more than you typically do because they think it's going to take a huge amount of time. It's going to be really hard. But unless you can listen well, you're never going to be able to share well and be able to engage well. I fundamentally believe that. And I, I still struggle with this. I think all of us struggle with how do we listen really well and who do we listen to and when do we listen to them? Who do we pay attention to? Because you can't listen to everybody. There's a sense of insecurity all the time with me. And I talk to other leaders too. It's like, am I listening to the right people? And this is the art. This is the art of listening because you know, you can't listen to everybody. Who were you listen to when and who, what channels and, and am I missing something? As a leader, the hardest thing, I, I, one of the people I interview from Australia, the CEO of Telstra, he shared the hardest thing as a CEO is knowing what's the truth. What is the truth out there? And listening well and listening at scale to the right people to accomplish your goals is really, really hard to do. I, I, the, my, my advice to uh, leaders is don't overthink this. Throughout the, all three stages, don't overthink it. Just Listen to some people and keep refining, keep refining. I'll, I'll give a personal example. I listen to about 400 people on Twitter. That's how many people I follow. I, I'm, sometimes I go over, sometimes I go under, but I constantly winnow it out to try to figure out, am I listening to the right people, people who can help me get smarter, get my job done, serve my clients, do great research. And I'm constantly finding, tuning that, adding people to it, taking people off because my interests and and passions have moved on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think listening is difficult even in real life. (laughs) And when it gets online, it becomes, you know, that much more difficult. So as we kind of get towards wrapping up the conversation, I am going to do, ask you a question of employee advocacy. This is a really, really a popular topic right now. And I was hoping that you could share with us, uh, where are you seeing this landscape developing? And what is it that you are feeling weary of as we are getting into this conversation? And what is it that you're feeling optimistic about as we start talking about employee advocacy? Sure. Uh, A really important topic. I see marketing driving a lot of this, primarily because they go, wait, there's a whole army of people out there who already know what we do, who have 10 times more followers than we do as a company, if you take all the numbers as a whole. So let's get them to talk about the company on their personal social media accounts. It's great. Put in this platform, have them press a button and have them amplify our marketing messages to their followers. And it sounds great on paper. And the reality is, I I think, do you even have that kind of relationship with your employees to ask them to do that? And frankly, what you're asking them to do is not be empowered and go out there and talk about a company. You're asking them to be parrots, to mindlessly 
just repeat whatever is being said to them. And I go, I would hope that you would have um, a, a, a better relationship with your employees who, first of all, trust that they would say something nice about the company rather than nothing or something negative. You would give them the opportunity to actually put it in their words so that their own words, so that their audiences could actually listen to it so much better if it has that personal point of view, that uh, personal advocacy of it. And that the content is rich and not just marketing messages, because frankly, no one wants to be messaged to. <laughs> it's true. Do you feel that while marketing might start this revolution, it will actually be HR people who will finish it? If you can get the culture piece right, then a lot of what you uh, just mentioned automatically falls into place. So I, it's, I think it's going to be an interesting relationship between digital and marketing and HR, and, and we are just about getting started. So I'm really excited about that. But yeah. th thank you so much, Charlene. I just want to thank you for all the work that you do. And I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. And it will certainly inspire us to start on this wonderful digital social media leadership journey that everybody just has to get on. So thank you so much, Charlene. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, thanks for tuning into the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and you were able to take away some ideas to start using in your own career as well as your leadership journey. That concludes this episode of Leaders Upgraded. But wait, your journey is just getting started. Go to www.leadersupgraded.com for more insights, more inspiration and more tools to continue the journey and if you have someone who you would like to nominate for the podcast or a particular topic you'd like us to cover, then also visit www.leadersupgraded.com and let us know. If you like this episode, please do share it. Please do subscribe to the podcast. And I look forward to continued upgrades with you. Take care.